Um, I'm going to talk to you about a program I was I made. Um, there were two of us actually um, in the 80s called Snot TV, which is a showcase for alternative underground British, well not just British actually, we did have European and American music on. Um, there was a lot of things, I think, that made it quite different. That was our ident. Um, so it wasn't like a lot of other TV shows. Um, it chronicled the British independence scene at the height of the British independence scene. So we had loads of artists that were just not present on the airwaves, that were barely present on the radio. So it was a very um, exciting, productive, alternative sector. Loads of these bands are still playing. And it was very diverse. You can see we've got Manic Street Preachers, but we've also got Josh Shepard. Uh, we've got the KLF, the Cramps, the Beatniks from America. It was really diverse. Um, we were on the BBC too. So next year, shockingly enough for me, since I was one of the makers, it was 30 years since that happened. Um, and Snow still has this huge active fan um, base. So next year, I think we're going to release some kind of product. Um, we'll probably set up our own YouTube channel since there's so many bad copies of things on YouTube, some of which I'm going to play you. Um, we'll probably write about it. I think there's some things about Sun TV that distinguish it from other television shows and that make it, in a way, have more in common with the kind of um, online creation that's going on now. So that's what I want to talk about, and I'd be really interested to hear if anyone thinks there's anything in that. I'm a practitioner. I mean, I went on to make television. So I'm not a theorist, but I do teach media now, funny enough. But so I'm interested if there's something pulling out, worth pulling out, you know, in, in a kind of more considered way. So, although Snub was on the BBC, it wasn't a BBC program. So myself and my co-producer, his nickname is Peter, um, we came from the independent music sector. We had never made television when we started making Snub. I mean, it's kind of unheard of now. So we saw ourselves as part of the independent music sector. He was, we'd met at Rough Trade Distribution. He was making, starting to make the first low budget videos. I come from um, kind of alternative radio in Australia. I went to work at Rough Trade. I set up a trade magazine that surveyed the independent sector. There was no internet. You phoned up the record retailer and told them what records were released that week or month. It, what, it's hard to believe now quite how old-fashioned and slow it was. So I'd set up a magazine at least monthly that did that job. And so we were totally, um, totally involved in that sector and that's where we saw ourselves and our passions. We absolutely saw ourselves there. Um, that's where we, we cared about the labels, we cared about the sector. I mean, probably no one here will appreciate, but actually, at that time, independent labels and artists, and they had seized control of production and distribution. This was an incredible moment. Independent labels, really productive, there was a nationwide, and in fact European-wide, network of independent distributors that ran totally outside the mainstream, parallel, and was selling huge amounts of records. Even some of the bands, like New Order, the Cocteau Twins, the Smiths, had started to get into the mainstream charts. So this sector had its own ecology, its own values, its own business ways. 
structures. So we didn't see us, we knew, I mean, we were not outsiders. We were not television people going, hmm, I've got a good idea for a show. We were embedded in that scene, and that's what we cared about, and that's what we wanted to represent, because nobody else was doing it. Um, this is a quote from the founder of 4AD Records. And he obviously thought that we were just like them. Our ethos um, was the same. We could do it ourselves too. Um, so that's what happened in the program. You'd get a, a clip or an interview and the eye would come up. Um, so the first thing that happened, I'm just going to give you some background because it's such an unlikely story in a way. Um, I was going to New York quite a bit because um, there were, I was kind of got to be a bit of a spokeswoman for the independent sector because I wasn't associated with the label, but I knew the labels. And we started making snob for a low, very low, zero money for a cable network. And I presented it, which you can see, somewhat embarrassing. This was, this was the very first time. Welcome back to Night Fight and Snuff. Tonight, hot from England, it's the motorcycle boy, Leather Nun, and Yahoo. Videos you won't see anywhere else, and your host, Brenda Jeff. <laughs> Hello again, and welcome to Snub, and the best independent music currently being heard in Britain. Episode 6 of the Unbeing Counting. A few shows back, I made some good reference to the fact that Scotland produces a vast array of talented pop bands. It's true, but tonight's show probably should have been presented from the north of the border as it features from Scotland, the Motorcycle Boy, the Shaman, and the Dragsters. Also coming up, a chat with Hula on the eve of an album release that surveys their output over the last five years. Sweet to learn none. Germany's Philip Burroughs Voodoo Club, and the most surprising crossover hit of the year, the first truly independent to reach number one in the British charts, Pump Up the Volume by Mars. So, um, yeah, they... We made it, I mean, you could see from that, I'm sure. I mean, this all this footage is on YouTube. We've never done anything to formally present our footage after the shows. There were a few VHS, remember them? <laughs> Compilations and that's all. But someone called me the female John Peel. I didn't really do smiling, kind of, you know, TV host. But it was such a contrast to what was on in America that it became a kind of underground hit. We just got ridiculously good reviews. But we were making it in our, on our weekends. We, we just had, we didn't have any borrowing equipment. It was ridiculous. We weren't making any money. And so we decided, decided to stop um, because it was also strange making a show. Of course, there's no internet, as I said. Well, you never got to see it. So we'd sent a tape to America. Once a fortnight it was. And then we, that, that was it, it was, we never saw it again. So we stopped and we, we thought we'd try and get a British deal. So that was in 1987 and we thought we'd go to Channel 4. Of course, Channel 4 had only been going for a few years. It was the upstart, the adventurous upstart. And um, the only place that this kind of adventurous music was um, the only space for it, on television at that time was in youth programs. We did not see ourselves as youth. We were making a music program that had an attitude and some politics and culture, you know, that's how we saw it. Channel 4, um, even though we'd already been making a series, told us to take, they'd introduce us to a big production company um, and we could do it with a big production company and we said no because we would just ended up being researchers on our own show, we were up for that. Um, so while we are trying to figure out what to do, we actually took a call from Channel Street Court and we thought it was one of our friends winding us up, because she's got such a distinctive voice. And she offered us um, 
She'd just taken over Def 2, always a maverick. She had, she didn't care, she was willing to take a risk. And she offered us a 30 minute slot on BBC 2, 7 p.m. Monday nights. It's such an unusual, it's kind of a good slot, but a strange slot for a program like SNUM. Um, and it is interesting to me, I mean, we thought Channel 4 was the, that Channel 4 was the adventurous channel. It turned out that boring old BBC had the nerve and the, maybe the confidence to, to let us loose. Um, so I always thought that was really interesting. So the BBC, of course, they had seen, we had a show, well, they'd seen me present. And um, they said, well, you're going to present again. And I said, mm, OK. But I really didn't want to present it, because all presenters become the tone of the show. They set the tone. And you like the presenter. You're too busy liking or not liking the presenter to think about whether you're actually enjoying the music. In particular, it was a problem with you shows where the presenter was kind of over-dominant. So we agreed to do it, um, but we never did it. Because we didn't want to have a presenter because we wanted Snob to be about the music and the artist. We didn't want it mediated through an on-screen presence that people, you know, I hated most presenters on TV. I didn't want that to be the snub, how snub was thought about, or written about, or listened to, or looked at. So, um, we just agreed to do it, and then we never did it, which is quite shocking. And probably only people who weren't embedded in television conventions would have dared do that. Um, the only other things that were on music TV at the moment was the chart show on top of the pops, of course on TV. There was nothing like that. And then John Peel of Paddy's Radio One show, and now of the musical probably tastes totally coincided or crossed over with him, with his. But that was late night on the radio. You couldn't actually see artists. John Peel, bless him, gave us a great review before the first program went out. And that probably stopped the BBC freaking out that they got delivered a show that didn't have a presenter. I'm sure that really helped us. So the other thing about Snub was that, you know, part of us being part of the scene was that, I don't know if any of you know the work of Adrian Sherwood, of On New Sounds. He's a, really a kind of or he should be a legend in British alternative music. On New Sounds was an indigenous dub production house that worked with Jamaicans and New Yorkers and Brits to produce some of the most unusual, most original, kind of proper dub white crossover music. Quite heavy in a dub way. So we, our theme music was On New Sounds. Um, the I was called by later um, attitude by Vaughan Oliver. At the time, all these people meant something kind of culturally. Vaughan Oliver was doing all the 4AD label um, design. And there was something about not having a presenter which gave, I mean, I've had people say it was hallucinatory. It would come on the TV and you'd kind of go, whoa, um, what the hell is this? I'm going to play you a little bit of the title. A treat on Snow Tonight for all your guitar fetishes. With the TV debuts of Darkside, Spyro Rex, and Many Street Creatures, the return of Dinosaur Jr., the Pixies of Valuria, plus the techno wizardry of the scientist and Canadians Frontline Assembly. First up, from their just released album, All That Noise, The Dark Side. So 
So we, we did it, that was the eye and the voice was, was, our, was our presenter, was, it was the tone. So we had a huge amount of freedom. I mean, we had unheard of, ridiculous, I still gasp thinking about how much freedom we had. We sent a, the BBC a tape once a week. If we didn't hear from them, it had passed its technical review, and that's all we needed to know. We never had a commissioning meeting. Nobody ever sat down and said, were well, you doing this wrong, you're doing that right, this is good. Who's going to be on the show? Nothing. It, it was, we were very happy with that relationship with the BBC because it meant that we had total creative freedom. Um, the downside, we had no money. I mean, the first series was made for £5,000 a programme. And there was no cheap digital technology. You couldn't um, do self-shooting. You had, and um, the BBC had very strict um, technical requirements at that point, so you had to have Betamax cameras, that meant proper crews. There was no onboard sound, so you had to have a sound recorder. You know, somehow or other, we managed to originate a huge amount of our own footage. We didn't pay ourselves for much. Because it was a it was a project of idealism and you know hope over reality in a way I don't know. Um, so we we didn't have very much money, but we spent it wisely. We thought, uh, not necessarily going into our own pockets, but as I said, we had total editorial control. So it wasn't a BBC commission; it was what they call in the lingo of book an acquisition in broadcast terms which meant they bought it off us, but we owned it. So that, that was the deal that we made that I would recommend highly to anybody who can make things without needing a lot of money. Unless you want the input of the commission, there can be a point to that, but we didn't want it because we were full of the idealism and um, creative energy of, of the time and we didn't think we needed it. We thought we were better off being outside. Um, so the shows themselves, we um, think they were a mixture of videos, some of which we'd made for bands, if we could. We really liked what they were doing, they didn't have any video, and it suited them rather than to have live. Original interviews, even when we couldn't afford to originate footage, we'd often do a live shoot or anything, we'd often just interview people. We interviewed the KLF, for instance, and um, New Order, but we couldn't shoot them. And then we did film around Britain. Um, we filmed live shows around Britain. And now I look, think about it, I think that was really important. We just did it because, of course, you wanted to be stuck in London, and especially 1990, the whole Manchester thing exploded. It would have been ridiculous to do what we were doing and not, and not go to that. But the fact that it wasn't a London-centric show, I think was really important. It's certainly really important to, um, to, our, to our audience, because we know because, of course, no email. We used to, after a while, our own mail truck. We had so much post that the post office used to send a separate van with our posts. And, and, it, like, and uh, we know from that that um, it meant a lot of The Cocteau Twins have been expanding the boundaries of pop for nearly a decade with their otherworldly sound and this raises unique language transcending vocals. This is the second of two tracks recorded live and short by Snap on the E of the Cocteau's announcement of an amicable split from their label of the last nine years, 4AD. <laughs> I'm not playing you 
very much of this, but um, I just wanted to give you a little flavor of some of that. It's like women are obviously redefining themselves, and we come from, I guess, a post-feminist generation. There are all these women that keep saying, well, I'm not feminist or anything. I'm thinking, what are you? <laughs> you don't like women? You don't, like, you don't think we should be anything? Sure what to, uh, this footage is particularly nasty. I don't know what, I mean, it's all YouTube, but I don't know what, how they've managed to get this up. But I, I just put it in because of the crazy energy of, um, of the beatniks. Especially because it's ironic, obviously, because he's talking about TV on TV. She only believe what this television, this tube is telling That's Michael Franti, who's had a very, um, you know, that looks a great career. We weren't the BBC. We didn't mind. So, but that was, it gives you a sense of the intimacy sometimes with which we, um, okay, with which we approach what we were doing. So, I'm going to skip the rest. So, we didn't really care if you had a, if you were well known. We had lots of debuts on Snub. Even Manuscript Creatures made their debut on Snub. We didn't care about Glossy. We had new water videos on, they were beautiful, and um, beautiful was good, but it wasn't the point. And we also programmed for di you know, diverse textual, visual, um, audio diversity. So we did think about it. I just have to play you a tiny bit of the four because, but actually I'm gonna miss my main point. Maybe I'll go back to that if there's, if there's time. Um, so I think there were three things that made Snob special. From our point of view, for me as a practitioner thinking about what we were doing back then, um, we were connected. We were not outside observers. We were inside the scene that we were documenting. We, we, okay, we weren't the labels, the artists, but we we affiliated there and we knew it really well. We came from outside the mainstream, we brought those attitudes with us and, and that approach to what we were doing, both televisionally and musically. And we had complete freedom, artistic editorial freedom. Those three things were really crucial. Times were really different. We didn't have digital production. Come to us on TV, edit. We would have all of the things we had in a program written on cards, and then we'd be moving them around the floor to try and get a timeline. Because once you laid something down on tape, you couldn't go back. You had to go back in the program and start again. We didn't have a lot of money. We had to try and get it right first. So no digital production tools, no email. Um, so that was different. But try to imagine 
being on television and having that freedom now, it's impossible. We didn't think we were making a youth program. We didn't care about youth. We wanted to make a, we wanted to make a, a cultural program, a music program that reflected the brilliance. You know, these weren't kids often. We had, you know, we had bands like Wire on who would talk for days of the intellectual importance of what they were doing. So it was not just a music show in that way. So I think that Snob, in a lot of ways, prefigured this, the, the, the now of digital creation and distribution. So now you can make content free of editorial control, with total freedom. And you can afford to do it and you can put it online. But how do you make any money out of it? Is that important? You've still got to afford to post it. And it's really hard to find it. Unless you're inside, you know, I mean I know there's other ways now to publicize it, but it's, that's it. <laughs> Leave you with the eye. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Can I just ask, just what brought you here as part of the conference? Because it, it seems like your, your own story is going in a different direction. Why, why come to an academic conference? What were you? Because I'm to? interested to see um, whether. It's, an in, it's interesting to explore the story of snob in a more considered way, other than just it exists as an artifact, we're going to release stuff next year, the marking anniversary, what do people make it, of it? Is there something that's worth discussing? The answer may well be no. Well, are there any questions for you? Yeah. Hi, um, just to share what happens in Malaysia for independent musicians. Yes, um, because I used to uh, be a part or involved in the Malaysian music industry before. Mm -hmm. So um, I can say that um, the Malaysian music uh, independent artist is much more powerful than uh, artists signed with major label at the moment. And that's interesting. Yeah. And also, um, they are contributing by them with themselves. They are working themselves. Uh, according, accordingly to contribute to have this kind of TV for Malaysian independent artists. But at the moment, uh, monetize is the problem. We are women yeah. not supporting, yeah. as you mentioned just now. Yeah. And uh, with the advent of technology, what they have is they post everything through the Facebook. Yeah. And this is how they promote yeah. and distribute yeah. their products. And you haven't got any, any um, labels that want to... They have their own labels. Okay. They, they do it according uh, to DIY concept. Yeah, 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 as was yeah. done back then. Yeah. And this, what happened with Snub was that it was yeah. a certain moment mm -hmm. where this there was critical mass in terms of an alternative industry. Um, and that's what made that kind of, you know, kind of, it surfaced into popular awareness exactly. for a while exactly. until that whole scene imploded for Lack of money, basically. Yeah, so I was interested to see whether that, um, whether there was something of academic interest, I suppose. What do you have in mind by academic interest? I don't know. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Should I be doing a PhD writing about snuff? But I wouldn't really want to spend seven years of my life doing a PhD. I don't know. I mean, snob has been written about in PhDs, and I don't think anybody's ever really got it. Um, of course, no, no, why would they necessarily? But it was often thought that having no money gave us the authenticity, but that wasn't, we had that, wasn't to do with how much little money we had, I don't think. Obviously, we were up around the edges, and something about the um, immediacy and he took what we were doing, gave it something. People forgave some of that roughness. What would you have done with money? Well, indeed. What would we have done with money? We would have, um, and that possibly, we would have paid ourselves, that would have been quite good. We would have been able to, we could have originated everything, and then that would have really been a game changer, not having to be reliant on 
not that we hated the promos we played, but we would have been in control completely of the look of it. And it wouldn't be a nightmare now trying to go back and negotiate rights with publishers. Because mm. even though we own, we obviously we don't own only underlying copyrights. So that is an issue. But is anything in what I said, do you think, interesting enough to be reflected on further? And if so, what was it? What is it? I think you mentioned about money. It's kind of like back to the classic debate in the music industry. It's kind of like the commerce and the creativity. It's like, for example, like some um, independent band in China, like they, was, they are struggling. Like Mimi said, that they, yeah. it's like they were struggling and they're facing like, like the, they don't really have enough budget. Mm -hmm. But once they signed with a record label, they got enough money. You know, they have like yeah. few yeah, money yeah. get involved, and then the music sounds different. Yeah, and they became yes. like very quite like popular, like in yeah. mainstream sounds. But they, they, the music is no longer the same as yeah. they, they do before. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really interested in the resonances between us, what we were trying to do then, and what some people are clearly doing now. And I think that's interesting. Is it, has the digital age enabled similar kind of projects that, um, that represent alternative scenes to, on their own terms in a way, to, to, um, to flower? That does interest me a lot. Anyway, yeah. there you go. I think to create the awareness as well is kind of important to the government, for example, in terms of monetizing and also some of organizations or maybe non-government organizations for them to get involved, like contributions or collaborations to yeah. make this kind of um, in favor, for example. So, yeah. But you have to find, you know, kind of filmmaker collaborators that share the values. Otherwise, you just end up like a kind of bad top of the box or something, you know. Because some, some of, I mean, uh, not to say um, I'm skeptical, but some of them, I mean, in, maybe in government or on the board level, is kind of skeptical uh, or narrow thinking of alternative kind of music, independent of course. music, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. So, might be one of, you know, the reasons why. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.